Good morning. <laughs> so I'm Katri. Uh, hello from the University of Helsinki. Oh, we're currently running a project where we examine empathy and interaction with the help of uh, emotion technologies. We're interested in uh, what makes people think and whether we could promote empathy and uh, high, fruitful interaction also in online and digital interaction environments. So, um, and in terms of service design, we're also interested in whether we could use emotion technologies to kind of take a deeper dive, <laughs> to borrow from the previous presenter, into the human experience. If we could kind of use technologies to superpower empathy in some situations. Today I'm going to speak about three things. First, I'd like to deal with this rise of human-centered thinking uh, in business. Uh, why is it, is it such a big thing? Why is it such a trend at the moment? Uh, why do we need to think about humans in general? <laughs> um, then I'd like to speak about empathy in, in greater length. Why do we need it? What is it good for? What is empathy on the level of the brain? Uh, what types of mechanisms give rise to empathy? Uh, how does empathy work between brains? And lastly, I'd like to regard empathy as a skill that we can use and, and also take a look at how emotion technologies could kind of superpower our empathy skills in some situations when we really want to understand the emotional side of human experience. First, let's speak about the rise of human-centric thinking. I don't know if uh, you've paid attention to these headlines, but to me it seems like all of a sudden companies have realized that, that they are, there are people that they are trying to serve and that people are also are employees in companies. We're becoming more interested in, in human beings and I think this is fantastic. It's a beautiful thing. We should be interested in human beings, but it's, it's somewhat uh, odd that it's, it's a new thing, that it's a new trend in business. Because if you think about it, hasn't work always been a human-centric activity? <laughs> Don't we work because there are other people in the world whose problems need to be solved or whose needs need to be met? So I propose that work has always been human-centric. And if you think like this, then I guess the good news is that as long as there are people with problems in the world, we will have work. <laughs> Because if there's one thing I'm certain of, it, it is that problems are abundant. <laughs> when you solve one problem, people come up with four new ones. When one human need is met, people come up with new needs. But perhaps in this uh, kind of hyper-connected time, human-centeredness is, is highlighted because, um, because there's more competition. Um, and when there's more competition, customer needs typically diversify. People want uh, services and products that very specifically respond to their personal needs, to, the, to who they are as people, to their values, to their personalities, to their emotions. And this, this perhaps um, uh, accentuates the need for empathy because the better you are at understanding how the needs of two customers differ, the better you can respond to these needs, the more accurate, the more precise your product or service can become. Another reason why human-centeredness or this, this talk of uh, the need to understand customers in a more comprehensive way is, is highlighted is perhaps uh, the development of technology. <laughs> As we come up with smarter and smarter uh, tools, it kind of shifts the balance in, in what people are needed for at the workplace. Now, I've been thinking about like, what, what is the optimal complementarity between uh, human intelligence and artificial intelligence. <laughs> What kinds of things should we let the machines take care of? What, what type of thinking is, is highlighted in human work? And here is my suggestion for kind of like the status quo. If you think about all the cognitive skills that working requires, <laughs> the list might look somewhat like this. And I propose that on the left side of the slide are cognitive skills in which we've kind of lost uh, the race. <laughs> so cognitive skills in which uh, machine surpasses man. <laughs> and it might be slightly unnerving that these are exactly the cognitive skills that our current IQ tests measure. <laughs> so if someone asks me, will, will machines at some point be more intelligent than human beings? Well, yes. They already are in very many ways, <laughs> like your basic pocket calculator is smarter than you in many contexts. <laughs> That's a slightly depressing thought. <laughs> and I guess there are studies showing that the IQ of human beings is slowly declining. <laughs> 
And this, of course, causes tremendous worry. Is humankind becoming more stupid? Uh, well, of course not. If our IQ points are declining, I think it's just because we're utilizing technology efficiently. We don't need to keep things in working memory that much anymore. We don't need to remember phone numbers, for example. That's a banal example, but you know, you get the gist. And actually, uh, we conduct a lot of studies with adolescents. So we have a lot of uh, children and adolescents come into the lab and we measure their brain. And in a lot of studies, we need to control IQ. So I do the IQ, I've done the IQ test to a lot of adolescents and their working memory sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to worry me, but then I thought that about like how, well, how do we measure working memory in the IQ test? Well, it's a task where I, uh, I kind of um, I produce a string of numbers at a really kind of irritatingly slow pace. So I go like three, eight, nine, four, three, two, seven, and then you have to repeat and also in reverse order. And the kids today suck at, the t at this task, but of course older people do very well because they have had to memorize phone numbers. <laughs> so I don't think that this means that the youth is stupid, it just means that they're utilizing technology in an intelligent way. And to me, intelligent human action is a combination of what our brains are capable of it's a com uh, and, and how we kind of supplement our brains with technology. So intelligent action isn't just about what's inside your head, it's about how you use technology in a fruitful way to meet the problems and the needs of other people. But then if we look at the right side of the slide, here's my proposal of some cognitive skills in which machines need a lot of help from human beings. <laughs> I like to put it that way. So I propose that the flexible thinking, flexible cognition, being able to understand the contextual things is something in which humans excel. Uh, we're better at understanding how and noticing how situations change and responding quickly to these changes. We're better at, un at understanding how this context differs from the previous one and how we need to adapt to respond to this change. All moral, ethical issues, uh, understanding meaning, <laughs> uh, these are endeavors in which uh, humans are needed. Then they also say the creative thinking it is something in, in which we kind of surpass the machine. But of course, there are, al are algorithms that can create poems or, or uh, that can um, come up with music. But perhaps the creative output of another human being is somehow uh, valuable in a different way than the creative output of a machine. A couple of years ago, I was speaking to the research director at Spotify. And they have a very uh, strange plan. <laughs> They're uh, putting their money on, on, on people wearing more and more sensors like these so that they can collect data on people's feelings and emotional reactions, physiological reactions, while they are listening to music. So the plan is that while you are listening to music on Spotify and wearing some sort of sensor, they'll get accurate data on exactly what kinds of sounds you find pleasurable. <laughs> and then using this data, they can create an algorithm that would compose music for you that always sounds good. Think about this scenario. <laughs> it might work, <laughs> um, but perhaps, and it might be valuable, it might be a great solution to some sort of problem. So I don't think it's a race between man and machine, it's, it's just that um, the creative outputs of men and machine might be a little bit different, they might be valuable in different ways. I do think that it's strange, as a strange thought, can something be always pleasurable? Or do we need kind of um, music pieces that really suck <laughs> to value the good ones? I don't know. Well, um, did you know that within each of our, our skulls we have the most powerful learning machine in the world? Do you feel like it right now? <laughs> <laughs> perhaps too early in the morning. <laughs> but according to some studies, the human brain learns uh, more quickly from fewer examples and can more uh, flexibly utilize the information that it has acquired compared to machines. Now, of course, uh, machine learning and deep learning especially is, is advancing with great strides. But for the moment, <laughs> for the time being, uh, we, we are best at learning from our environments. Um, but perhaps in the context of work, Creativity and learning are, are, are somewhat similar. 
perhaps in the context of work, uh, being creative is more about understanding how to uniquely respond to human needs, how to uniquely uh, solve the human problems that are at the core of work. Um, and in any case, I, I have the opinion that humans should focus only on creative work. All human beings should do creative work. Because if we have a task, uh, and we know that with the outcome that we want to have, then this is a task that can be really easily optimized, that, that machines can more efficiently take care of. And lastly, of course, because I study empathy and interaction, <laughs> uh, I propose that these comprise of skills that are pretty difficult to teach to machines. Um, of course, we have robots, that, uh, like caretaker robots. We have machine vision algorithms that can detect emotion information from your face. But perhaps there are some aspects of human interaction and empathy that are really difficult to automate. And it's an intriguing question that can we, can, uh, are all human skills uh, teachable to machines? Can we teach machines to take care of everything that we can do? I think there's a limit at some point, uh, but of course the, the limit is al always moving. So this is perhaps one reason why uh, we're becoming more interested in human beings, uh, simply because these are tasks that the machines can't take care of. <laughs> So, next I'd like to speak uh, more closely about empathy. I hope that you're interested in the topic. Perhaps I've been able to convince you that this is a highly important work skill actually for anyone. <laughs> so let's take a closer look at uh, some of the uses. Now, one of the most important things about empathy is that, of course, it's a collection of skills that kind of lays the foundation for any interaction. And as we speak more and more about things like co-creation, we need to think about how to make interaction work. In Finnish, there's this saying that joukossa tyhmyys tiivistyy. <laughs> and I don't know how to translate it, but we've all had the experience that teamwork isn't always perfect. Uh, teamwork doesn't always, or co-creation doesn't always result in wonderful outcomes. Um, perhaps science could help us in understanding when things happen in, in interaction, when what type of interaction leads to the best problem solving. Here are a couple of studies that have kind of caught my attention. You probably noticed this one. So Google tried to investigate their teams and tried to understand what predicts team success at Google. What types of teams are most successful at solving problems, at, at uh, making great products? And they found that this <laughs> very kind of soft sounding quality of interaction called psychological safety best predicted whether a team is successful at Google or not. And this makes me very happy because it's, it feels like, you know, soft skills and soft values are becoming the new hard ones in business. <laughs> we're, uh, we're beginning to value these kind of really soft sounding qualities, for example, in interaction. And psychological safety could um, actually be rephrased as just kindness towards others, being friendly towards others in your team. I think the value of niceness is highly underrated in business. <laughs> but psychological safety in this study meant that, let's say we're a team, uh, our psychological safety is high if I feel like I can make mistakes in front of you or present unfinished ideas without the worry of be becoming ridiculed or you guys laughing at me. Or if I, if I feel like if I wanted to, I could share something personal with you guys, then our psychological safety is high. This, of course, links to the second uh, predictor in this study, which is mutual trust. So if trust is high in the team, then problems get solved and the team is successful. And then came uh, a little bit more traditional predictors such as structure. Does the team understand why they exist, what is expected, uh, what they can do, what they cannot? experienced meaning of work and experienced effectiveness of work. So did the team members experience that their work had some sort of effect <laughs> within the company? Uh, did the uh, kind of customer benefit from what the team was actually doing? So that's a kind of uh, very simple recipe for team success. <laughs> Starting from the kind of softest concept I've ever heard of called psychological safety. Well, here's another study that kind of tells the same story. 
Uh, it was published uh, a few years ago, and these researchers tried to um, see what predicts a team's problem-solving power. So what teams were most creative together? What types of teams could best solve problems together? And they used a term called collective intelligence. So they were interested in what types of teams, in, in which types of teams does collective intelligence emerge? And they found that, for instance, uh, the IQ of team members was not relevant for collective intelligence, but most important was the quality of interaction within the team. And like this study, because it goes into specifics about what is uh, quality of interaction. And in this study, interaction in which these characteristics were present led to the, to the best results, led to collective intelligence. So no monologues like this. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, short speeches, if you spoke, you didn't take up a lot of time. Responsiveness towards others, so if someone says something, you react. This is sometimes difficult for at least Finnish people. <laughs> um, and everyone becoming heard. Fourth, the empathy skills of the team members predicted collective intelligence. Uh, and this is why it sometimes really bugs me when people speak about empathy as a soft skill. It seems that empathy underlies our ability for, to be collectively intelligent. And it seems that collective intelligence is how we solve the biggest problems in the world. It's actually how we've survived up until now, by putting our, our smart brains together. And uh, in terms of these results, it's, it's interesting to think about your typical meeting. <laughs> what is it like? Uh, or the, uh, what type of interaction do you find yourself in, guided by the structures within which you work? Like for example, um, before the previous parliamentary election in Finland, uh, they had this panel debate for party leaders at the University of Helsinki. And then they wanted some researcher to give a very short talk before the panel, or uh, I'm sorry, after the panel discussion of the party leaders. And they asked me and they gave me one and a half minutes <laughs> for a short talk on science. That's how much science politicians can take. <laughs> So I decided to speak about this study because I think it's so, I, I like it so much. And it was kind of um, embarrassing that before my, my talk I had to listen to the panel discussion and I assure you that none of these characteristics were present in the discussion of the party leaders. <laughs> so it was embarrassing for myself and as well as for the panel uh, when I finally took stage and well, you know, this is what it is needed for, for problems to become solved. But the point here is that I'm sure that party leaders are empathetic, intelligent individuals. But they were forced into an interaction structure that inhibited this. So the panel isn't the best place for empathy. The panel isn't the best structure if you want to promote collective intelligence. It's not only about the skills you have, but, but about the structures within which or through which we collaborate. Um, another reason why empathy makes sense, why empathy is needed, that if, if we really want to understand another human being, if we want to understand the decision-making or experience of another human being, we need to understand emotions. And emotions are also something that's typically overlooked in business, in, uh, or for example, in, in the design of digital, um, digital tools. And this probably stems from the fact that for very long people have thought that you know you can separate emotions from other type of thought. That emotions have nothing to do with rationality. Well, that is not the case. Why? Well, just because you really just can't turn your emotions off. <laughs> They're present in all kind of thinking, in all kind of decision making, in all kind of rational endeavors. I have a few examples. I wonder if you've seen this study. It's a study where they try to uh, see uh, what is the probability of uh, a person getting out of jail. So they looked at the decisions that a judge makes during a day, and they found that there are three points during the day, three times during the day, when it's most probable that the judge is in favor of parole. So three times during the day when the judge is kind of um, most willing to let you out of jail. <laughs> Tell me what these three points during the day are. Louder breaks. <laughs> Morning coffee, lunch, and afternoon coffee. 
And these are individuals who really strive to make objective, rational decisions. They, they make decisions about people's lives. But they are perhaps not so much in touch with how their emotions influence their decision making, that this type of pattern becomes, uh, becomes possible. This is actually a really depressing, depressing study. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, a study that's perhaps more fun about how emotions intertwine with decision making. <laughs> this is how easy we are, you know. <laughs> so in a wine shop, customers bought more French wine if French music was playing, more German wine if German music was playing, and lastly, customers bought more expensive wine if classical music was playing. <laughs> <laughs> One more example from the United States. If a waiter uh, brought, their, brought the bill in a cardioid di uh, dish, they received more tips than if it was like a, a circle or something. <laughs> of course, these are examples of how emotions kind of get in the way of rational decision making, or examples of how kind of out of touch we can be with our emotions, and we don't even ourselves understand how they influence our decision making. We're very unaware of how our emotions guide what we perceive and what we choose in this world. But emotions are highly important. We can't do without them. It wouldn't be a good idea to turn your emotions off when you make decisions. Uh, because, for example, we have patients uh, who have a lesion in a part of the brain that's responsible for dealing with emotional information. And what happens is that these patients become unable to make any type of decision. Any type of decision. So this makes life very complicated when in the morning you can't decide which foot to use to get out of bed. So there's no getting around the impact of emotions. Uh, that only leaves the, the possibility of trying to understand them. First, of course, as ourselves, we need to kind of get in tune with how our emotions influence our thought. Well, we need to be able to identify the emotional signals that guide our actions and decision making. And then if we want to uh, design services or understand the customer experience, emotions are something we need to consider, something we need to gain experience and understanding of. And that is why empathy is important, because empathy is a skill with which we can understand emotions. It's actually the uh, only skill with which we can really comprehensively understand the emotional part of human experience. And this is how, um, in neuroscience, we typically approach empathy. <laughs> we see it as a collection of skills supported by, in part, separate brain mechanisms. So we speak about skills we have of understanding other people, uh, skills we have uh, for experience sharing, so actually experiencing the feelings of other individuals. And we speak about mechanisms that allow us to act in empathetic ways. Now the mechanisms that are needed for each, uh, for understanding we use our mentalizing network of the brain. Uh, so we use it to kind of put ourselves in another person's position, understand the world from their viewpoint. We use it to imagine how people think and feel and might act in certain situations. And I think a better name for the mentalizing network of the brain would be just your imagination. <laughs> your imagination is a highly important empathy skill, which means that in any line of business, uh, imagination is a highly important work skill. But this is something that's generally overlooked. You don't see that many you know, talent programs for employees that aim at enriching their imagination. <laughs> that's what I'm still waiting for. Uh, the mechanisms that allow us to experience other people's feelings or share experiences are collectively called neural resonance. Sounds very new agey, and the more you look into these mechanisms, the more new agey it becomes. <laughs> Because uh, there are mechanisms in our brains that, on a certain level, don't make any difference between you and I. So if, if you uh, would fall down and hurt yourself, the pain areas of my brain would light up. If you would move, certain neurons on my motor cortex would activate. Um, if you would smile, <laughs> yay, <laughs> my smiling muscles would automatically activate, and so on. So we have these mechanisms for making emotions contagious. And through experiencing other people's emotions is how we gain understanding of how they're doing. And this uh, brings up an interesting point. If we want to create 
AI that is exactly as empathetic as human beings or empathetic in exactly the same way as human beings are, then AI would need to have an imagination as well as uh, a, me a mechanism for feeling human beings' feelings. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's possible without consciousness. So perhaps that's the kind of ultimate kind of thing that separates us from machines is consciousness. The ability to consciously reflect on our own feelings and thereby also the feelings of other human beings. It might be interesting that if a person has a lot of psychopathic traits, this part of empathy is disturbed, but this part works very well. <laughs> so you can be empathetic but still uh, act in a callous manner towards others. You can use empathetic empathy for, for example, manipulation. Empathy doesn't lead to moral and good outcomes for other people. It's a skill that can be used for uh, different types of goals. Uh, so they have studies showing that, for example, if if a psychopath sees another person in pain, the pain areas of their brain don't light up. And they've also shown that yawns aren't contagious to psychopaths. This is perhaps something you need to forget about. <laughs> but there are studies showing this or that, or that smiles aren't contagious to psychopaths. There are also very interesting studies showing that if you have a lot of power, if, you have like a, if you're like a C-level executive, then you, your pain areas of the brain might not light up to other people's pain as much as if with individuals who have less power. And it's an interesting finding. Our researchers think that perhaps when you gain a lot of power, when you rise in the hierarchy, you just need other people less. And then your sensitivity to social signals kind of becomes dampened. It's interesting. Or then, you know, uh, you need these types of qualities to rise to the top. But they also did this, uh, this fun study where they, they put subjects into groups of three and then they just really arbitrarily decided that now you, you are the boss of this group. <laughs> and then they had some sort of discussion task and in the middle of the task they brought four cookies onto the table. Four. So one cookie per person and one extra cookie. And most probably the person who had just been named the boss of the group ate the extra cookie and in a very lavish manner so there were crumbs all over him and you know chewing with the mouth open <laughs> <laughs> so if we want to increase empathy for example in co-design processes hierarchy is not the way to go um, the third part of empathy could be called compassion perhaps sympathy and it comprises of mechanisms that can reward us for kindness we're wired to be kind toward towards each other to enjoy helping. Uh, for example, there are studies showing that generous people tend to be happier and live longer. <laughs> so in summary, empathy is a collection of skills that allows us to kind of put ourselves in a pretty conscious way in another person's brain, see the world from their point of view, that allows us to share experiences. And this is kind of our only tool for really understanding how another person is doing on an emotional level and to make empathetic acts. In practice, empathy is a series of assumptions we make about other people. So we assume that, I assume that I kind of know what you're thinking and how you're feeling at the moment. Most often, uh, our assumptions are wrong, <laughs> especially when we don't know the person with whom we're interacting or uh, towards whom we try to be empathetic. So our, our assumptions about other people's feelings and thoughts are usually wrong. Uh, that means that uh, if we want to kind of try to make more valid assumptions about other people, maybe you should try the following. The first thing that uh, empathic accuracy is, uh, requires is attention towards another person. So we need to attend to, uh, toward the person who we want to understand. We need to, and through this attention, we gain information that kind of feeds our empathy mechanisms. We see um, their facial expressions, we hear the tone of their voice, we see their body language and so on. Um, the second thing that is needed is the motivation to understand. <laughs> and this is where I think uh, empathy usually stops, for example, during online discussions. <laughs> uh, the viewpoints of the other person are just so different that we're not motivated to understand. The third thing that is needed is relevant previous experience. 
And just yesterday, I heard um, a lady told me uh, about this uh, story that, to her, perfectly re reflected the difference between sympathy and empathy. But to me, it sounds like a difference between experience. So she told a story that they, they were watching a video in a group of men and women about golf. And what happened was that one of the golfers struck the ball. The go it was a man sh struck the golf ball. The ball uh, um, collided with a tree and ricocheted back towards the nether regions, <laughs> <laughs> causing intense pain. So the golf ball struck the guy in the balls. And, and the, <laughs> the guys watching the video went like this. And the girls watching the video went like, oh, oh my god. <laughs> so your empathic accuracy, how, how well you understand the experience of another person, depends on your own experiences. <laughs> depends on whether you've, you've had the experience yourself. I'm running out of time. I'll quickly show you uh, some fun things to increase empathy in addition to those. Uh, they found that music, for some reason, increases emotion contagion between uh, people who don't, don't know each other. So if you want to kind of get on the same wavelength with another person emotionally, music might do the trick. Why? Well, perhaps it's the rhythm. They've also found that uh, rocking in rocking chairs in the same rhythm improved collaborative ability and made people like each other more. <laughs> than rocking in rocking chairs in a, a different rhythm. Fiction also seems to work. For some reason, reading fiction, but not non-fiction, improved empathy skills. Why? Well, perhaps it's something that feeds your imagination. It gives you relevant experience of other people. The arts in general, I think, work just like this. The arts are a way of peeking into the minds of other people, of, of kind of expanding your experience of the world. Perhaps that improves your empathic accuracy by helping, helping you kind of empathize with different points of view. Um, in summary, I think the, the best way to increase empathy is to think about what inhibits it. Uh, we're all born with empathy. We all have the required mechanisms for it to emerge. And it typically does emerge if we just spend a moment in the same rhythm. We just kind of connect on a human level with another person. But there are many things in our environments that can inhibit empathy, and, and sadly, internet is one of them. <laughs> Why? Um, well, I think it's because emotions travel pretty poorly online. <laughs> We have very poor tools for conveying emotion-related information, especially in text-based interaction. Um, and that is where I think emotion technologies will make a great difference. So if, if emotions are conveyed uh, with poor quality online, well, we do have ways of measuring emotions. We, have do, we do have ways of kind of um, broadening the emotional bandwidth of digital environments. And this is what we're exploring at the moment. Uh, we have sensor technology that we can use to measure heart rate, heart rate variability, skin conductance. All of these tell us something about a person's emotional state. We have machine vision algorithms that can expose the true feelings of Leonardo DiCaprio after he received his Oscar award. <laughs> this is the ground truth. <laughs> so, he's happy. <laughs> And we've tried a route with some of these technologies to see if we could reveal emotions, if we could kind of um, superpower empathy in some situations, or reveal uh, emotion information that was previously missing. So this was a thing we did with the Olenta Collective. We measured the emotions of concert goers with machine vision, and then we made this thing where people could go into a container and see how people are feeling at stage one or two at any given moment and feelings were, or the changing feelings of the audience were portrayed in this digital sculpture. For some reason, they also let us stick an EEG device on a soccer player. <laughs> we did this feel the game thing where we measured uh, EEG from a soccer player during uh, the study in Derby. So for 92 minutes, we got live EEG, and we made an application where people at home could see how Tommy Vesala is feeling in real time during the game. <laughs> so putting emotions somewhere where they were previously missing. And I think the, the biggest difference between enjoying a game at home or at the stadium is the feeling. You're not as connected to the players as you are when you are at the stadium. And one last example, at the Sonar Festival last year, uh, we made this thing where we measured um, 
uh, heart rate and skin conductance with bananas, mm -hmm. <laughs> while two people were enjoying a musical performance. We wanted to see whether we could expose their feelings and how in sync they are while they're enjoying music sitting in our banana chairs. So we made this very fantastic discovery that usually if you want to measure a person's heart rate or skin conductance, you need to stick electrodes onto the body. If you stick the electrodes onto bananas and have the person grab bananas, they work just as well. No other fruit, just bananas. <laughs> so our thinking is, in all seriousness, is that usually we try to understand human experience by observation, questionnaires. But people really suck at understanding their own emotions. And even though we have empathy skills, we really suck at understanding other people's emotions. So what if you could use this technology to, in real time, measure emotional experiences during, uh, for example, a service, during uh, some sort of um, product consumption or whatever you'd call it? It's an interesting, interesting kind of prospect for the future. But it is in the future. Uh, you probably had the feeling that you know sticking electrodes on bananas is pretty far from really in real time gaining understanding of another person's emotional experience. So there are things to do while waiting for the tech to become empathy enabling. And I think one of the most important things is uh, understanding the structures within which we interact. These can either inhibit or allow for empathy and collective intelligence to emerge. And I like this example. <laughs> this is a fine example of, of an, a structure that in many ways inhibits empathy and collective intelligence. Uh, this is Finnish parliament. <laughs> and if you think about the organization, it highlights competition. It highlights uh, kind of a group thinking, so us versus them type of thinking. If you think about the interaction that takes place in this hall, it highlights monologues, there's very little responsiveness, not any, any, everyone gets to speak. And the more you think about this, the more kind of at least uh, worried I become, because these are people that need to solve really tough problems. <laughs> Maybe this, this structure is what explains the kiku minutit, you know, <laughs> or the aktivi malli. There are smart people, empathetic people that just um, that aren't allowed to use these qualities. So I think the main message of this talk is that empathy and the ability to be collectively intelligent are something that we all have. Uh, the best way to increase them at the moment is to think about what inhibits empathy, what inhibits collective intelligence. And in, in addition to technology, there are a lot of things in the structures within which we operate that do this. That is all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.